Welcome everyone to the 28th an annual Rose Scheinberg Lecture. I'm thrilled to see you here. I'm Naomi Sunshine. I am chair of the Scheinberg Committee. I want to start by briefly telling you about our namesake, Rose Scheinberg. She's a 1950 graduate of, the law, of this law school and was a woman ahead of her time in many ways who was motivated to go to law school by Red Scare activities in New York City in the 1940s. And to honor her memory, her niece and nephew, Jill and Richard, set up this committee and lecture series. Jill and Richard, activists in their own right, are with us tonight on the live stream. Hello there. We're so happy that technology enables you and many others to be here tonight. The Rose Scheinberg Committee invites a lecturer working at the intersection of race, class, and gender to the law school each year. We've had an incredible lineup of speakers over the years, and many of their lectures are available on our website, which you can access using the QR code on this card. Our introducers and moderators have been incredible and accomplished radical advocates in their own right. And I'll tell you about this year's moderator in just a few minutes. But before I do that, I wanna tell you about the other important thing you should know about the Rose Scheinberg Committee, and that is its structure. The committee is student-led. The students choose the lecturer and do all of the work involved in planning the lecture. It's a really important feature of our committee that we are student-led, and that was by design, and always brings new energy and ideas to our work. I want to acknowledge and thank our current student members who've worked tirelessly to put this event together. Three L's, Alina Tullock, Crystal Okafor, and Dan Lee, and two L's, Kiana James, Hamza Hussein, and Tanya Raha. Uh, and I'd be remiss, yes, thank you. <laughs> I'd be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity while you are all here to do some recruiting. Each year after the lecture, we start our process of recruiting 1L students to join the committee. So please look out for an email and a docket post about joining our committee and please seriously consider it. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to be involved. I want to also acknowledge the faculty members of our committee, Liz Chen, who I know is in the room somewhere. She's checking in people outside. Um, Sylvia Law, who's with us on the live stream, who's the founding chair of the committee and who's been an incredible inspiration all these years. And a special thanks to Professor and amazing immigration advocate, Alina Das, for your many years of service to the committee. She is cycling off the committee this year. Uh, and finally, I want to give a special thanks to my colleague, Zach Stewart, who's done tremendous work behind the scenes to make today run smoothly. Uh, we also have an incredible group of co-sponsoring student organizations. I think we have over 30 this year. They're also listed on our website, uh, which you can access again on the QR code on the card. Our speakers have been amazing over the years, and I wanted to briefly mention that um, we were originally going to have three panelists tonight, but one of our panelists unfortunately had a death in the family and is not able to be here. Um, we also, again, as I mentioned, have had uh, incredible introducers and moderators over the year um, who are often uh, incredible activists in their own right. And I'm thrilled to get to introduce you to this year's moderator, Hei Young Yoon. Hei Young is Senior Director of Policy at the National Domestic Workers Alliance and former Executive Director of CAV Organizing Asian Communities. Over the course of her legal career, she has championed low-wage and marginalized immigrant workers' rights at the Urban Justice Center, where she represented low-wage and immigrant service industry workers, including those in domestic work, restaurant, and construction, and where she was co-lead counsel on Iqbal versus Ashcroft, a civil rights case on behalf of half of two South Asian and Arab immigrant men wrongfully detained and subjected to cruel and inhumane treatment in the aftermath of 9-11, and for which she was awarded Trial Lawyer of the Year finalist by Public Justice. At the National Employment Law Project, she served as Director of Strategic Partnerships and Deputy Program Director, working to expand economic opportunity and security for working people in our economy. 
In her current position at NDWA, she continues to advocate for the rights of nannies, home care workers, and house cleaners at national and state levels. Hey Young is also former co-director of NYU's very own Immigrant Rights Clinic and currently serves as a member of the Biden-Harris administration's COVID-19 Equity Task Force. Hey Young, we're extremely honored to have you moderate our discussion tonight, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Naomi, for that gracious introduction. It's so nice to be back here. Um, so as Naomi said, I co-taught the Immigrant Rights Clinic with Nancy Moore, it's like over a decade ago, so I'm dating myself. but. I just remembered the student, the clinic students being incredibly committed, incredibly strategic, incredibly creative, um, and just the deep appreciation for the commitment to both create more justice in the world and the ability to advocate for low-wage immigrant uh, families and communities. So it's really nice to be back and very much looking forward to today's conversation. So um, as Naomi said, I'm gonna moderate the panel. So let me do a quick introduction of our two panelists, and then we'll give them an opportunity to remark for about five minutes, and then we'll do, I'll sort of moderate a conversation amongst ourselves, and then open it up to all of you to ask the panelists questions. So, um, I wanna, before I introduce the panelists, I wanna say maybe like a brief comment that today's conversation on the resurgence of the anti-Asian violence is really important and very much needed and very timely. I know this conversation is difficult and uncomfortable because to talk about the anti-Asian violence, we have to talk about the racial hierarchy in this country um, in terms of who's on the top, who's on the bottom, who's wedged in between. We also have to talk about um, anti-blackness, white supremacy, and the lingering tension between Asians and blacks. But I also know that you all know how meaningful this conversation is because it allows us to understand our collective histories, past and current struggles, and really pave the way for more justice towards more full multiracial democracy and society. So I'm super excited to be part of this conversation with the panelists, but also with all of you. So let me first introduce uh, Saloni Bauman, who's to my right. She's a scholar and historian who writes, thinks, and teaches about work, housing, caregiving, sexuality, and immigration. She's currently a PhD candidate in the Department of History at Yale University. Her research intersects, interest focuses on histories of race, gender, social welfare, migration and labor in the 20, 20th century United States. She's a member of the New York City Asian American Feminist Collective Leadership Committee. Her writing has been featured in the Washington Post, Truth Out, the Boston Review, and the Radical History Review. And Senti Sojwal is an India-born, New York City-bred writer, communication strategist, and a reproductive justice advocate. She's currently media relations director at the Center for Popular Democracy, the nation's largest multiracial organizing network, and has been named one of the 15 AAPI feminists everyone should know by BuzzFeed News. Santi ran the award-winning Feminist Five column at Feministing. She's a co-founder of the Asian American Feminist Collective. So let me turn to Saloni. I'll actually let Santi begin. Oh, sorry. Our comments. No, that's okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to extend my deepest gratitude to Naomi um, and all of you for bringing us here. I know how um, grueling law school is. I have a lot of friends and loved ones who um, are in process of becoming lawyers or are lawyers already, so I am shocked and humbled that you would take time away from all of your studies um, to bring us here and have a conversation with us, so thank you so much. Um, also, just really humbled to be sharing space with Hey Young here, who is like just an amazing advocate and leader and really grateful um, to be here. 
Um, I just want to start first by acknowledging the present moment that we are living in. So as everybody here knows, some of the recent instances of violence um, that we are contextualizing in this moment are um, that this month is the one year anniversary of the Atlanta spa shootings where eight people were killed, six of whom were Asian women. Um, just this January, uh, Melissa Alyssa Go was pushed onto an oncoming R train at 42nd Street and died right here in New York City. Um, in February, uh, in Chinatown, Christina Yuna Lee was stabbed to death in her apartment after a man followed her into her apartment building. Um, and just a few weeks ago, an elderly Asian woman was brutally beaten and called racial slurs in Yonkers. Um, and these are tragically just a few of the instances that we know have occurred not only in the past two years, but for generations and lifetimes. Anti-Asian violence has risen sharply during the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, from March 19th, 2020, through the end of last year, nearly 11,000 hate crimes, um, which is a framework that we're gonna be discussing a little bit more throughout the course of this conversation. Um, targeting those of Asian descent across the US were reported to the adv advocacy organization Stop AAPI Hate. I want to acknowledge that our communities are hurting deeply in this moment. In particular, it is Asian women and femmes who are experiencing the most pain, targeting, and fear. Many activists and advocates have pointed out that these instances of violence illuminate the real life consequences of the political and social invisibility of Asian Americans. This invisibility comes from Asian Americans being seen as permanent foreigners, unable to cross the invisible line into becoming real Americans. While this violence is devastating, gendered and racialized violence targeted Asian Americans is nothing new. I quote um, the academic Ann Cheng when I say, to this day, the Asian American woman occupies a weird place in the American racial imaginary. She has absorbed centuries of the most blatant racism and sexist projections, yet she hardly registers in the public consciousness as a minority, much less a figure who has suffered discrimination. From racism against Chinese railroad workers in the 1850s to Japanese incarceration of the 1940s, to the KKK targeting Vietnamese refugees, to widespread Islamophobia post 9-11, our communities have always been the targets of bigotry and violence, often at the hands of the state. In particular, the racialization and sexualization of Asian American women is rooted in a long history of American imperialist conquest and war. The normalized sexualization of Asian women that presumes sexual availability is racial the proliferation of Asian women in media depicted as sex workers, as docile, as sexually available, particularly to white men, from Anna Mae Wong to the present day, persists and is violent. Stereotypes like the China doll, the dragon lady, exotify and sexualize Asian women. The historical and ongoing racialized and sexualized perception of Asian women at the vector of exoticism, docility, and promiscuity have had the effect of excusing and tolerating this violence by ignoring, trivializing, and ignoring it. In particular, when we think about the Atlanta shootings, which happened about a year ago, um, the idea that the Atlanta killer's victims were temptations that had to be eliminated is a narrative intertwined with cultural representations of Asian women, dominant Christian ideals of purity, and narratives from anti-trafficking groups that seek to close down massage parlor businesses because they claim explicitly that sex addiction drives men to buy sex. Many see more police and expansion of our carceral systems as a solution to this violence. At AAFC, um, and for many progressives, we call on community-oriented solutions to this violence. We have seen calls for culturally specific police programs like NYPD's Asian Hate Task Force. We do not believe that task forces like these will make us safer, but instead put our communities, especially the most vulnerable, at much greater risk. Furthermore, the city has no right to scapegoat our communities. The NYPD has a long history of perpetuating violence within our communities, especially against people like sex workers, asylum seekers, taxi drivers, street vendors, delivery workers, and massage parlor workers. 
Despite these historically massive policing budgets that we experience here in New York City today and endless task forces, these reforms have never stopped Asian American anti-Asian racism from happening in the first place. We question the city's decision to supply more funds towards policing of already criminalized communities rather than providing things like language services, community resources, and cultural competency training that our communities deeply need. At this moment in New York City, we face a housing crisis, a mental health crisis, an addiction and opioid crisis, staggering income inequality and houselessness, and an ongoing pandemic that disproportionately affects working class and people of color. We deserve investments and resources in our communities now and always, not an expansion of the systems that harm and abuse us. Uh, we're really looking forward today to exploring where we can go from here, how we can build towards liberatory futures for our communities that are truly based in justice and care. Thanks, Senti. Um, I'll echo some of Senti's comments and thank uh, the Scheinberg Committee and Naomi and NYU Law for having us. It means so much to kind of see and hear our work um, contextualized in this forum, and um, we certainly are so flattered to be here with Heyoung, who we've already learned so much from, even just planning um, this panel. Um, and I'll also start by acknowledging some of the same events that Senti mentioned. We're gathered here today because of the many Asian lives lost, disrupted, harmed, as a result of white supremacist violence. But I also wanna emphasize something that we talk about less as a society, um, and that's that this violence so often takes on a patriarchal form. We can't understand the loss of eight lives in Atlanta, the murder of Christina Yuna Lee, the murder of Alyssa Go, without honoring that part of their identity, a uniquely gendered part of their identity. There are also a couple of things that I'd love to draw out in our conversation today. Um, and the first is kind of about the fraught and fragmented category of Asian American. Um, one of the fault lines that often reveals itself in our coalitions and as we talk about what it means to be part of a community that may have been created through shared history or through a census category, depending on your perspective, is around ethnicity. Um, I'll obviously point out that Senti and I are not East Asian. Uh, we haven't walked through the world um, and this particular moment of anti-Asian violence and crisis experiencing it in the same way as many of our um, co-organizers and colleagues have. However, our experiences of racialization um, have brought us into conversation with those people repeatedly. And so um, I kind of wanted to just draw that out and focus on that for a moment. And I invite questions about that too, because I think that whether or not that political coalition is one that's useful for us um, is worth having a conversation about. Another is around class. Um, with this rising tide of violence, there are names that I venture we've all heard many times, um, but there are also some names that we hear less often. I think in particular, and we've had many conversations about Yapan Ma, who was attacked in Harlem while collecting cans. Um, he had been laid off from his restaurant job during the pandemic, and he often collected cans with his wife, who was a home health worker. Um, Ma's wife likely was asked to work 24-hour shifts, as many home health workers are asked to in New York State, um, and was likely compensated for only 13 of those hours when she did work them. Um, I think that we can make an argument that that too is a kind of anti-Asian violence that we have to reckon with as a society. So within this category of Asian America, it's clear that some of us are particularly vulnerable to violence in particular moments. Um, by virtue of how we are in the world, the way we move through it, the spaces we occupy, when and where we commute. Um, and some have argued that those fault lines represent irreparable boundaries that we can't cross or that our organizing can't transcend them. I think there's great value to specific community-based organizing, of course, but I'd also like to make an argument that our differences enable a kind of solidarity. What can we learn uh, by centering the experiences of those who are often framed at the margins of the Asian American experience. Uh, what might we actually take away from a question of policing or extra police surveillance by putting the experiences of South Asians after 9-11 in conversations with uh, people who are requesting more policing on subway trains? After the Atlanta spa shootings, we noticed in our organization that there was a particular kind of reckoning that we'd never seen before in both the mainstream media and in Asian American communities 
around gendered violence and the hypersexualization of Asian American femmes in particular. People saw violence in that moment that reflected their own experiences of being catcalled or harassed or fetishized on Tinder, menaced, et cetera. Um, and I'd like to ask how we can work to make sure that that moment of recognition transcends just March of 2021 and might translate into how we can be in better solidarity with massage parlor workers and sex workers uh, who are often at the edges of our own communities and who we often silence in our own activism and organizing. In particular, um, I'll talk a little bit about Assembly Bill uh, 8281, which is currently in front of the New York State Assembly aims to decriminalize massage work, but I think that that's one of the places that we can um, really center what communities who are affected by the violence are asking for. I also wanted to talk very briefly about the category of hate crime, which is so often a solution that we see um, kind of put out as one of the ways that we can combat violence. And I wanted to think through a little bit about what hate crime legislation means to us and what it does for us. On one level, uh, higher sentences and harsher punishments are associated with a kind of recognition from the state that I think many of us crave in this moment. Recognition that our lives have value, that the community that we're part of seeks to protect us as well. Proof that we as Asian Americans are part of America and will be defended as such. But when we think about community safety, I urge us to think about whether or not hate crime legislation makes any of us feel safer if the experience of locking people up in jails or caging humans um, makes us collectively any more likely to experience the kind of safety that's lasting and might have true meaning for decades to come. Um, I'd also like to point out that we all uh, have different kind of stakes in this conversation. And we have to be able to have a more um, vulnerable kind of engagement with what we mean when we talk about safety. Uh, we've talked a lot about how um, those of us who commute to the last stop on the train or work late at night or um, our street vendors or nail salon workers or massage parlor workers have a different kind of vulnerability um, to both state violence and interpersonal violence. And so I believe, and I think AFC as a whole believes, that part of what we need to do as we think forward and move forward is to envision safety holistically and think about what are the many facets of a safe existence. Um, we think a lot about slow violence versus spectacular violence, um, the kind of slow violence that happens when home health workers work 24-hour shifts or delivery workers have their tips stolen. Um, how some lives are constructed by society as inherently less important or more disposable on a structural level, and how that might affect how um, the targets of violence become defined in particular racialized ways. Um, safety might mean safety from pollution, safety from uh, traffic violations, safety from um, the experiences of interpersonal or intimate partner violence, safety from the kind of economic isolation that makes people stay in relationships that are no longer safe. Um, Senti and I have both worked for an organization called Sucky um, that works to actually empower um, people who are facing gender-based violence. And often the solutions that um, we foreground are not rooted in police or uh, the criminal legal system, but rather in um, how we all show up for each other, um, how we answer the phone, how we talk to people through crisis, how we might safety plan. And I wonder if this conversation that we're having today might actually benefit from some of that same ethos. Um, as we talk about different scales of violence, uh, the hypersexualization of Asian American femmes and the permanent sexual availability of our bodies is not solely culturally constructed, right? It's part of an ongoing um, system of violence that is created by U.S. empire, that's created by U.S. Um, military bases in Korea and the Philippines, in state policies we've had towards women who are perceived as sex workers, in the construction of our immigration laws over centuries, and so um, I'll kind of wind down there, but I hope that we, in having this conversation, can broaden the scope of what we think of when we think of violence. Great. 
Thank you, um, Santi and Saloni. There's a lot for us to dig in, but I want to first begin with um, a question. So I think as an East Asian American um, and work having the privilege of working from home through the pandemic, I um, felt like I've spent the last two years um, experiencing very quiet personal fear of what is happening in New York City. So. I think many of you know this like West 4th Street subway, like we all been there trying to game the system of like whether the E and the F is coming by leaning into the platform to see. And, but my husband is the one who's like, don't, he knows that and he's like, don't do that anymore. You no longer can do that, right? I have um, nieces who says she is afraid to like, stand um, on the subway station, like she says she's got her back uh, to the wall, right? So this kind of, so I feel like, and these conversations are definitely happening around kitchen tables, over diners, over drinks. So I'm curious, like what is missing in the current kind of debate or conversation that's happening that should be there? Thank you for just naming some of those real world responses to some of this violence. I think I've been having really similar conversations with a lot of my friends and community members of alongside with that sort of like the fear around the train, you know, people having to do things like, you know, take a cab late at night when you maybe can't afford it um, or maybe even deciding like not to leave your house after 10 or 11 p.m. Um, I'm from New York City. I grew up here and I, I can say like with a fair amount of privilege that I have very rarely felt unsafe um, in New York. And I think it has been an incredibly challenging and difficult time as a native New Yorker and as an Asian American to be living here and experiencing this and seeing um, the real world implications of that as well. Also, I think, you know, in response to your question, I think something that's missing is building on what Saloni mentioned of how do we maybe expand our notion of what violence is. I think it's also about expanding our notion of what community safety is and looks like. Um, when we think about things that have been happening in New York, even just this week, um, we met with some of you earlier today to have lunch and we were speaking about um, Eric Adams tearing down several homeless encampments. Um, I believe like over 200 people over the past few days, um, only five of whom um, decided to go into the shelter system. And, you know, I think that oftentimes when the response to anti-Asian violence is like, let's build out our carceral systems, let's create more policing, it's also really behooves us to think about like, who are we keeping safe? And if we actually wanna create a safe city, that means creating a safe and livable city for everybody. Um, tearing down homeless encampments is an act of violence that makes our city on the whole more violent. And so I think something that feels like it's missing for me is, is that definitely, how do we think about community safety? And also I think that we struggle and think a lot about the tension between the fact that uh, like a lot of people who are calling for increased police forces are marginalized people. A lot of times it is Asian Americans, Asian women, and Asian femmes who are the targets of this violence then saying, what I want is more police. That makes me feel safe. So I think a lot about how our responsibility as um, social justice advocates and as feminists and as abolitionists is also to expand um, and bring other people along in a larger journey of reimagining our society and what it can look like. Uh, for a lot of people, safe, safety maybe does feel like it equates police and prisons, but it's actually our responsibility to interrupt that and interrogate it. And I think moving towards a future where we think about safety more expansively is primarily a project of imagination, of care, and deep love. I think that we owe that to ourselves and our community to also ensure that we, you know, we get to sit here at NYU Law School, um, you know, all of us amassing our degrees and, you know, living fairly comfortable lives. And so I think that we owe it to ourselves and people who are facing this type of violence every day, people like 
domestic workers and street vendors um, who don't get to be in places like this, um, to bring them along in our journey of how we imagine a society without police and prisons and carceral systems and center their experiences when we're talking about community safety um, and help others to, I think, come along in our journey, one of great privilege where we have been able to sit in um, like elite classrooms and debate with other people who come from privilege about um, what it means to be safe or what legal theory is. And so I think that's something that is missing from the conversation that we think about a lot and have, I think, all of us a lot of work to do. Yeah, I agree with all of that. And I also think that something that I found is really missing from our conversation are some concrete demands outside of the carceral system that we really could dream up if we're thinking about how to make that train scenario safer, for example, perhaps more trains that ran frequently and on time. Um, and I think a certain kind of um, flexibility with how we're willing to ask the wealthiest New Yorkers to participate in our collective safety is something that really could enable that. Um, the MTA is underfunded. Our mental health services in the city are underfunded. We've lost a great number of mental health beds in public hospitals in part to um, make room for um, people who are sick with COVID, but those beds have not come back as our surges have gone down. So I think kind of a, a unified theory of how um, one ripple has many effects is important. I don't think that it is solely um, the work of anti-Asian rhetoric that has stirred up uh, this new bout of violence. I think that we are experiencing a real thing where more people are unstable on our streets. Um, people are having a hard time. Um, we often joke that even in professional settings, everyone we know is somewhere between you know, unwell and unhinged. And so <laughs> there is obviously a trickle down effect of how that affects everyone. But we currently have this sort of um, zero sum game of where resources can go. And I think that we need to be able to expand that pool to really address some of these solutions in ways that are not short term, um, but are not necessarily forever problems. You know, we might take decades to get to a future without police and prisons. Um, and I think that while we have to have conversations about that, there are more immediate municipal solutions to some of our problems that um, might not rely solely on more police. Um, and I think something that's really been transformative is having conversations about what makes people feel safer. Because often I find that the mere presence of um, more officers on a train platform makes very few people feel safer. Um, in fact, it's more lights on your block or more people or knowing your neighbors. And so you feel that someone will look out for you on the corner or talking to your neighbors. Um, so some of those things are structural and policy oriented, but I do think that there are um, more immediate solutions that help us get to uh, a middle ground um, that aren't necessarily carceral. I think what's missing that you, know, that you also just bring up so beautifully, Saloni, is like just an abundance mindset. I think a scarcity mindset is something that comes from white supremacy. Like we are all constantly, you know, ravaging each other and competing with one another for like the few scraps that our policy or our government can give us when, you know, I just saw a New York State budget that has $850 million for a stadium in Buffalo. When people in this city don't have enough food to eat and don't have homes to live in. And I think like, there, there are more than enough resources for all of us to survive and thrive, and what we actually need and deserve is leadership that is willing to put our communities at the center instead of dividing us and making us fight one another for resources that we all deserve to have and actually can have. Great. So one of the things I learned in both like representing low-wage immigrant workers, whether it was in litigation or advocating for low-income working class folks is that the sheer resiliency, right, that people are in motion at the same time that they may be experiencing fear, concerns, right? So could you talk about what are the things that communities are doing that is not visible and that is not being covered right now in the mainstream media? 
Um, I, yeah, we can point to a few things. Um, I think that we have seen that have been, I think, just really like imaginative projects of community <laughs> solidarity that I would love to see more of and be a part of that I think all of us can support. Um, you know, throughout the course of the pandemic, I think we have seen a rise in things like mutual aid funds and community fridges. I think that many of us felt abandoned by the state and abandoned by those in power over the past two years, especially um, people from marginalized communities, um, low wage workers, people of color. And I think that some of the beautiful parts of what came out of that was a real feeling of like, you know, we keep us safe and we are here for each other when our government abandons us. And so um, I think that's something that has also given a lot of our communities a deep sense of purpose. I visit my community fridge in my neighborhood a few times a month and have built some friendships around that. And I think that we have also seen um, community programs like elders being able to call a hotline um, in Chinatown or other parts of New York City where there are large concentrations of Asian communities to be able to have somebody, for example, like walk them home um, if it's late at night. I think that's something that we've seen that's been amazing. And I also just wanna say like in New York City in particular, I can only speak to that because this is my home and where I've grown up and lived. It's like there are so many um, Asian immigrant organizers and organizations who have been on the ground here every day for decades doing this work who need to be funded and who need to be recognized and who have been doing this work long before um, anti-Asian violence was in the spotlight. You know, somewhere like CAV, which is an incredible organization that has done so much work like right around here and in Chinatown, um, fighting housing injustice and displacement of immigrants. And Saki, where I worked for three years and where Saloni has also worked, um, which I think like sort of again points to this abundance mindset that I really, I wanna think about in political terms because like the solutions are already here. There actually isn't a need to like create anything from scratch. Like people have been here and have been taking care of one another for a very long time with or without the support of the state. And we are the experts on our own experience. Um, the cops or Eric Adams or whoever, <laughs> definitely not Eric Adams, is, is not the person who should be in the position of leadership telling us what our communities need and deserve. Um, we have been here for a very, very long time. And I think something else that this kind of points to that I've sort of been ruminating on over the past couple of minutes is also that, you know, there is sort of this like widespread understanding or stereotype maybe that Asian immigrants or communities are somehow not political or like not active political participants. Um, and you know, we obviously know how very wrong that is. Um, but the fact of the matter is like, our people have been leading these movements on the ground in New York City, all over this country, all over the world for a very long time. And what we actually need is support and ampl amplification of the things we have been doing for generations already. Yeah, I will just add to that. I think there has also been a, a great deal of organizing and direct response to some of that anti-Asian violence. Of course, these hotlines where you can call and have someone walk you to um, your subway stop or home. Um, Red Canary Song is a really incredible organization that works with massage parlor workers in Flushing. Um, and it is very much a for us, by us kind of organization. Um, they've been instrumental in getting that assembly bill I mentioned that decriminalizes massage work um, to the state assembly and has been have been doing a lot of advocacy work that will make a material difference in people's lives because it is Asian women who are disproportionately prosecuted under that unlicensed massage statute. Um, I've also seen, you know, in addition to the flourishing of various mutual aid funds or free grocery stores, and they really are everywhere in so many different neighborhoods, um, I've seen people step up in all sorts of uh, ways to combat particular kinds of state neglect. We talked a lot about composting programs at lunch this afternoon, um, and I do think that the kind of service reduction and response model is something we've seen a lot of, um, where people identify the things that they want to keep going. So my last question uh, before I turn to all of you to ask uh, questions. So we've covered like in terms of like what's missing in the conversation, um, 
more bold, creative, imaginative solutions, community-oriented solutions. And there's a whole host of issues that's connected to the resurgence of anti-Asian violence. And um, in my own work, where I sort of am much more in the low-wage uh, worker space, there's been this incredible kind of momentum um, in this moment of this unique kind of like pandemic kind of out of economic recovery um, and our labor market our labor market being super tight workers have much more voice and power right that there's been this really incredible um, and exciting worker organizing across the country in different low-wage service industries right um, because there is worker shortage, wages are actually rising, right? And so I think it's, it's not for everyone, right? Um, because that sort of uh, ability to uh, go and find a new job doesn't exist for everyone, but it is definitely happening. So, and I've come to doing this work in the midst of the pandemic, I've come to really realize and reminded that we all have a role to play as things are in motion, right? That, and I'm a firm believer that everyone has a role to play in creating more justice in the world, right? So as before we open up, just wanted to invite um, both of you to share like what may be some opportunities for people to plug in and right? And what may be, you know, if you have advice or about how do people plug in what they should be doing? That's a great question, and I think the kind of mobilization of workers everywhere right now is incredibly exciting to see, and it is the kind of organizing that I think happens when you are talking to your coworkers about what uh, the conditions of your work are, what kinds of demands you want to make, and as we talked about a lot at lunch, um, unionizing your workplace is profound, right? It's a transformative experience for many people, um, and I think it can be one of the few arenas where you can um, feel that you have a political voice that is emergent. Um, but that being said, I think that the opportunity to plug in um, will really depend on who you are and where you locate your community and what your strengths are. Um, Senti mentioned Saki, uh, which is an organization that I have long admired but never really worked for um, in a formal capacity. And Saki actually expanded their uh, kind of uh, crisis response hotline hours this year uh, to go from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m., but the 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. shift would be all volunteer staffed. And the response of volunteers was actually tremendous because people do want to help. And it's very difficult work. It's kind of emotionally draining work. But if you have the capacity to um, answer the phone, talk through violence planning with someone, talk through safety planning with someone, if you are able to be on a hotline, I think that is a wonderful way to plug in. And it kind of connects us to one another. Um, I've also been thinking a lot about kind of the personal choices we make every day and how we structure our lives and whether we structure our lives to make room for um, political advocacy and to understand the many people who work in service-oriented jobs as people with whole lives. Um, and I guess I've been particularly troubled by the proliferation of these new 15-minute delivery services um, all over the city, which cannot possibly be good for any of the workers working for them um, on their face, but kind of pose this delectable convenience for the rest of us. Um, and I think that it we are kind of at a time where being um, engaged and part of a community means understanding that there are consequences to each of our desires and actions. And um, while structural solutions can't be solely individually willed into um, changing something, I think that that kind of mindfulness is a way to plug in and is a way to sort of think about um, whether or not you are in genuine and authentic relation with the people you talk to and come into contact with. Um, and if you think about them as people um, and think about how they make their lives and if the structures that we participate in are sustainable for everyone involved. I think building on that, um, 
you know, something that we think and talk a lot about in our work um, at the Asian American Feminist Collective is, uh, you know, solidarity in practice, not just words. Like, what does solidarity actually mean and how do we live out that value, especially cross-racially? Um, to me, solidarity means having a responsibility to one another. Uh, you know, Audre Lorde, of course, said none of us are free until we're all free. What does it actually mean to embody that as a practice in your life and in your relationships? Um, I think I, I loved what you said about just like, you know, bring it back to the neighborhood. Like, where do you live? Do you know your neighbors? Are you, I am absolutely a gentrifier in the neighborhood that I live in. That means that I have a different responsibility um, if I choose to live there. It means like, I should know, um, you know, the name of my bodega guy. It means that I should tip really heavily. It means that I should try to be an active participant um, in my neighborhood and supporting people there who need help. I think. It's also about like something important that we can do to sort of talk again about the degree of privilege that many of us have here is that if you find yourself in a room where other people aren't present, um, whose voices need to be there, it's your responsibility to bring those voices there. It's your responsibility as a person of privilege and education who's allowed to enter rooms where decisions are being made and critical conversations are happening to ensure that you're lifting other people up with you and bringing them into that room, if not physically, then their stories, their experiences. That's a deep responsibility that I think we all have to bear for one another. Um, I also would say that Something else that feels really important is, um, and I'm speaking mostly to myself here, but get off the internet. Um, I think that online activist culture and conversations, I mean, particularly during the past two years, that has always been um, a space that I would categorize, as Saloni said, on the unwell to unhinged <laughs> spectrum. But it's just like every, like, <laughs> It's really hard for me sometimes to remember if I'm like too mired in a conversation about like who has the hottest take on Will Smith or whatever. It's just like, you know, there actually there actually is supposed to be like joy and possibility in our collective work together. It's not supposed to be just an echo chamber of who's the most woke and who can we cancel next and who's the worst person. And I think living too online takes me away from that purpose, which is that like to be able to be in relationship with one another and to exist in solidarity and have responsibility to other people is a project of joy and liberation and care. And oftentimes it can be hard to remember that when you're mired in that kind of um, online toxicity. So even though that seems like maybe kind of dumb, I genuinely think it is you know, how we exist in, in these spaces, like as activists, as advocates, as lawyers to be, as lawyers is like, you know, caring for ourselves and one another like is of the utmost importance. And I don't just mean that by like, you know, take a bubble bath or whatever. That's not what self-care is, you know, like the concept of self-care was created by marginalized people, particularly black women who were thinking about how, how is caring for ourselves and ensuring our own futures actually like a deeply resonant act of political resistance? And so I think that to be able to think about that really holistically in terms that genuinely matter for your life and other people around you is one of the greatest responsibilities that we have to ourselves and also to actually be able to practice meaningful political solidarity. Well said. So I'm going to open up for uh, for all of you to ask questions. Naomi, how should we do this? Should I just pick on folks? Um, yeah, can we go to the mic? Because I think that's part of Great. Thanks. Hey. Um, I... I love this talk. I'm really excited to have the speakers here. I first learned of the Asian American Feminist Collective from a conversation you did with black women radicals, and I thought it was just so amazing. I'm over in the moon tonight, too. Um, but that leads me to my questions. I have two. One, I'm wondering what black Asian solidarity could look like in this moment. How can we practice that? And two, I wanted to circle back to the point that I think each of you have made around ambivalence towards the state. Like, what is the role of these sort of task forces? Like, hey, you're sitting on one now. 
Um, is it a role of like co-optation or is there like some meaningful work that can be done when we come to the table with these government bodies that have done a lot of harm in our communities and that have largely abandoned our communities over the course of the pandemic? Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Great. Damn, you how much time to... do you have? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I love talking about the state, and often with my students, I do find a, a burgeoning anarchic vision among many of them, because the state is so um, fucked. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not it's a disappointing entity often, but I do think it is a redistributive vehicle that is unparalleled um, if we are able to actually harness it and. Uh, compel it to listen to us. And so, I'm a, I mean, I'm really a historian of welfare, um, and I think that that has been an incredibly punitive place, um, full of surveillance and control, but is also can be liberatory. And I'm thinking of things like the welfare rights movement or even um, mobilization for youth, some of my favorite uh, insurgent attorneys in the historical record, um, who really did things like make sure that school delinquency was addressed by actually suing bad landlords who were keeping kids from getting to school because they were in cold apartments things like that. Um, so yeah, I think that our relationship with the state must constantly kind of balance um, the fact that it is a wide reaching tool that is often um, driven by actors that have vested interests in surveilling and policing rather than actually expanding access. But it is kind of the widest reaching um, entity and it's already made. So I think that there's there's sometimes a, a limit to mutual aid. Um, and especially in that self-care form, I think that we all need to be able to um, live. And there is a kind of activist burnout that I think happens if you um, take it upon yourself to solve problems that are much bigger than any of us can actually affect change in. Um, I'll also say really quickly, it's Jamie Swift of Black Women Radical's birthday today. Um, so happy birthday, Jamie, if you're watching. Um, and yeah, the question of black and Asian solidarity, I think, is a really interesting one and kind of an ongoing process. We unpack it all the time um, with Jamie. We have a kind of series on the Asian American Writers Workshop where we talk about it in different arenas. So whether that's kind of um, thinking about school access and how to actually think of community in not such individualized ways, um, whether we think about kind of historical solidarity or third world liberation, um, I'm kind of always tempted to kind of gesture to the historical record, but I think that there is a, solidarity is kind of an active practice. Santi talks about this very eloquently, but um, I, yeah. Well, I was just gonna say, you know, we, um, thank you so much for shouting out our project. It's like one of our favorite things that we get to work on. Um, and I think to that end, something that, you know, we have always, um, thought about really concretely and, and want to amplify all the time is that we owe so much of an intellectual debt to black women in particular. Um, I think when we think about our frameworks for liberation of feminism, um, when we even think about these like imaginative processes of like what the world can be that we deserve, it's like, you know, Saloni and I and the rest of our collective too, like we, we you know, we're in our early 20s, like reading the Combahee River Collective for the first time, or like Audre Lorde or This Bridge Called My Back, like all of these writings and texts and intellectual labor and thought that was created by black women who we take our lead from every day in our political analyses. And so I think that this goes back to that question of like meaningful solidarity. What does it mean to both be in relationship with one another and recognize that while our liberation may be like tied and bound, it is different and it actually is really important to name that difference. Um, it's not just like, oh, we're all people of color, so it's all kumbaya over here. No, we experience many different intersecting layers of oppression and experience based on our lived identities. And so to me, like a true practice of solidarity between black and Asian community means that like we honor those differences as much as we recognize that we're striving to the same goals for liberation. And honestly, like it's messy. It's, it's, it's not always easy, but it's not supposed to be. Um, I think it can and should be a constant process of both self and community reflection. And that means that it's really hard. And if it's hard, that actually means that like good things are probably happening. So can I just add two points? Um, one on the 
the question of the state. Um, so, you know, I've been sort of embattling Congress because <laughs> we're trying to pass um, Biden's what was called the Build Back Better agenda, which was this historic once in a generational investment in working families um, and people of color and com immigrant communities. So, and I've learned so much from that campaigning. But one of the things that I've been really reflecting as we are sort of gearing towards the end of that campaign, uh, towards victory is it's, we made such incredible progress as a movement, even though we don't feel that way every day. So one reflection I had was back in December, um, we were doing a lot of travel to DC to engage members of Congress. And we had this uh, briefing in front of the Democratic Women's Caucus. So, um, and then we had our members talk to members of Congress, right? Um, and it was incredible and empowering for our domestic worker to talk about what she's been going through and the power she exerted in, so in that, right, was incredible and felt like we made so much progress even though we don't feel that way. And then I looked at the Daisies, and who were they? These were women of color, member of Congress, right? A member from Texas, a member from Florida, right? Women of color hearing from women of color talking about what women need in this country. And to me, like, whether there's a role for the state or not, or what the welfare state is, but I just think that there is a role um, and that it's a messy road, but the, the amount of progress we've made, I think we should say we're winning, right? It's a, it's a long arc, right? But I think we're winning, and I think just truly, really kind of appreciating that path that we've taken, I think is something to be said. Um, and on the, the kind of the solidarity, I think, you know, I'm not a historian, um, but I really do believe, I think history has a lot to teach us, right? I think history does matter. I think even to looking back to the, the 90s during LA riots, I think there was so much understanding and trying to understand each other's differences, what, where, the, the, where the prejudice, the racism comes from, how Koreans are, seeing blacks and what blacks, how blacks saw Korean immigrants, you know, opening up businesses in their community. I think there's a lot of history and there's a lot more work we did be, to be done, but I think there it's there. And as Santi said, it's messy, but I think there is, history tells us a lot. And I do think like where we all fit in in this like, racial hierarchy in this world, I think we do need to interrogate that and really dismantle and reimagine, right, as our panelists have talked about. Thank you. Okay. And maybe I can add one quick thing about the solidarity point, which is I think that we all really have to want it. And that has to be on all sides, basically. And we all have to be really committed to doing that hard work because I think it is, when we say hard, it's really hard. Um, it can mean uncomfortable conversations. It can mean giving up things that you think you should have. Um, it can mean any manner of things. So I think that um, kind of a collective agreement that we are invested in that as a mode of moving forward because there are other political analyses that people have, be that sort of, um, yeah, I'll, I'll pause there. Over there in the back. Hi, um, I have a follow-up question about uh, the role of the state as a redistributive vehicle. Um, how do you reconcile the state's role with international empire and things like, like the many coups in Latin America or the United Fruit Co. or like killing so many Muslim people for oil and um, vaccine apartheid and the subjugation of international countries of color with its 
and like the benefits that that brings America, like uh, directly like the military industrial complex providing jobs and education for low income people, for like directly subjugating uh, foreign people of color, um, as well as indirect benefits like cheap oil for Americans. How do you reconcile the state's role in redistributing goods from the international community to like the quote unquote global south um, with uh, your idea of using the state as a vehicle for redistribution in America's uh, more privileged people of color? Sorry if that was um, a wordy question. No, not a wordy question, a great question. Um, I think that the many things you're describing are in fact kind of the breakdown of that redistributive vehicle that I'm talking about. And I think it's kind of important for us to understand that just as the state uh, extracts and exploits resources, um, also people, people move in and out of our state all the time. And um, there is a flow of labor just as much as there is the flow of goods and resources and money out of other countries into ours. And I think that um, on the biggest scale, you know, abolish the state, abolish borders, et cetera. But I do think that um, when we make claims on the state, we have the ability to say, and obviously we are very far from this, um, that the Pentagon's budget should not have that many zeros in it, that we don't want military bases um, all over, you know, different Asian countries, that we um, want to hold and dramatically reduce the military. Perhaps there should be not a GI Bill, but universal public education um, at the university level for um, certainly everyone in this country, and that is a distinction that's uncomfortable, right, to say that there is sort of a bounded area that we're making claims about. Um, and I won't get too kind of academic because I think that I can kind of <laughs> cycle there about what role the nation state really has to play in any of our politics, but I think that um, the acknowledgement of the state needn't be an endorsement of its militarism or its kind of exploitative purposes. Um, it can function differently. Santi, do you want to? No, she killed that. Nothing <laughs> else. Other questions? One in the back. Um, so, just briefly, I'm just curious what your thoughts on the general project of defining what Asian American means, um, especially as I think there are like generational differences in how people define that and um, whether it's something that's worth pursuing or useful or, uh, and also how to like deal with the tension between being super local and the communities you work with might have a very specific idea on what Asian American means to them. And then at the national level there's different, or maybe on Twitter, there's like different <laughs> ideas about what that should mean and whether it should be more expansive. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm just curious if that's something that's even worth putting time into or should you just be invested where you can kind of thing. Great question. I think about this all the time. Um, definitely I'm not going to have a concrete response for you, but I really appreciate um, wanting to sort of interrupt and interrogate what that means. I will just say a little bit for, in terms of my own background, I think like I don't, like I would never have called myself Asian American. I don't think because that's not, I think now I, I have a little bit more of an understanding of what that means for me personally, but throughout the whole course of my life, you know, it's like, I'm Indian, my parents are from India, shout out there right here. Um, and like to me it felt, I didn't connect with the term Asian American. It felt so broad, it felt so huge, so all encompassing. You know, it like caught up in that and huge phrases like literal like generations, um, years and years of like colonization, history, um, many different ethnicities, languages, I think it's very useful for us to interrogate whether or not that term, um, just what it can be. I think that in particular over the past couple of years, I have also seen that term as a useful vehicle for solidarity, for important conversations, um, and for building bridges amongst our various communities. Um, I also think just honestly when it comes down to like 
you know, talking about the state, it's like, that's kind of how the state sees us, you know, census category, Asian American. How can we utilize that for an expansion of understanding what our communities need and what we require to survive? I think that there's been, there's been a lot of conversation about how there just isn't a lot of research um, and data about Asian American communities. So I think that that for me is like one definite starting point when it comes to the state that we can utilize that and we need more. You know, there isn't a lot of research and background on even like where we live, how many of us live in poverty, how many of us are undocumented, what our specific political and economic needs are. And because we are often not, um, researched in that way as Asian Americans, you know, that's how federal policy and funds are created. It's based on things like census categories. And um, in that way, I think like it's useful. I think in a political sense, I think that I would say now over the past couple of years, I do think that, you know, thinking about myself within the term of Asian America has been, I think in a lot of ways, like a very loving and caring experience, one that I appreciate, one that has allowed me to find really deep, important community. Um, but at the end of the day, like, I would never identify as just Asian American because I don't think it's encompassing enough. And I have a lot of other identities that I feel like are, um, you know, equally powerful markers of how I move through the world. But I would say that I think, I see it as an invitation to do more community building um, even as we recognize that it can be flawed. I think invitation is a really good way to put it. And I, I think it's important to remember the origins of the term as an explicitly political, mm -hmm. um, radical identification that named a shared history of colonialism and war and migration as sort of the organizing basis of a group. So the Asian American movement um, was a political movement. It wasn't solely an identity category. Um, and I think similarly to the term South Asian, you know, I'm also Indian. Um, many would refer to us as the hegemon of the region. Saying I'm South Asian is a form of at least linguistic solidarity with people who are in Pakistan, in Bangladesh. It's an acknowledgement of uh, Sri Lanka. It is an acknowledgement of sort of the um, limitations of political boundaries and kind of a more expansive, perhaps, cultural heritage, but also um, accountability to one another. So I think it's useful insofar as that um, legacy lives on. I think when we forget that, it can sometimes become silencing or minimizing of experiences that are not um, extremely at the mainstream of Asian America. Um, the term boba liberal gets like bandied a lot, a lot on the, our internet anyway. And I don't always know that it's super helpful, but I think that um, if identity is only a category that helps us find each other, um, it's limited. If it's a category that pushes us to consider um, why immigration policy might be your business even if you were born here, or why deportation is something that you see as affecting your expanded community, um, that's really politically useful. And I think can actually be mobilizing of the kind of more privileged elements of our, you know, fractious Asian American community. I pre so before I'm going to use my um, liberty as a model. So of the Asian Americans in the room, how many of you believe in that project or sort of see yourself as an Asian American? I'm curious. Okay. <laughs> It's an age-old question that I think that we, every generation talks about. So I was just curious. Was there a question here? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, thanks all for being here today. Um, so my question is about bridging the gap between people of our age and also uh, people of our parents' generations, the elders of our community. Um, I'm from New York, and like a lot of people of my parents' generation are very worried about their safety now when they go out. And I'm wondering how we can kind of like bridge the cultural and linguistic divide uh, to convey the ideas, like the long-term ideas of abolition across to them when they might be worried about short-term, immediate personal safety. Yeah, I'm obviously 
will depend on who your people are and what they respond to, but I think really talking about safety and when they feel unsafe and why they feel unsafe has been useful. Um, and I, I happen to live very far away from my family. I think they're watching on Zoom. Hi. Um, but I do think that as much as we were able to sort of show up to bridge some gaps in terms of um, if, if they feel unsafe walking outside or walking to the train, really um, delving into those things and asking what makes you feel unsafe. Is it when you're walking late at night? Is it if you're alone? Is it if you see certain kinds of people? And I think there's a vulnerability that we allow ourselves when we are talking to our families and when we're talking to people who we're already in relationship with, where we can name things that feel unnameable in you know, public company and actually work to unlearn them or um, think differently about them. So that's important. I also think that sometimes bringing in context from a non-US context is helpful. Um, I've especially found that sometimes talking about um, politics as a whole, you know, when we talk about uh, what state violence might look like or police violence might look like. Examples of that in India tend to be more resonant than examples of that in the US. And so I think there's sometimes a reorientation that can happen if we talk about contexts that are um, perhaps the like political originary context of who we're talking to um, and where they, I'm curious, you know, where your elders were, the elders in your community were when they were 16 and figuring something out or when they were in our kind of political moment. I think opening up those conversations without judgment um, is a good place to start, I'm not sure. Um, I promise I'm not just saying this because my parents are literally <laughs> here, but I, I do think that we have a deep responsibility to honor the experiences of our elders. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of, um, you know, I think, honestly, it does come back, as many things do, to this experience of privilege and question of privilege. Like, I never had to leave my entire family behind and cross an ocean and, um, you know, build my family in a foreign place and navigate racism like that that I'd never experienced before and reorient my entire life to a completely different society and understanding of what it meant to live in that society. Um, we know that oftentimes, immigrants come to the United States where they are racialized for the first time. And there, there are so many experiences that we are never gonna have as people who have had the experience of growing up here. And so I think I implore us to bring some of that curiosity and also care into those relationships with our community elders. Um, I also think like something that has been incredibly valuable in my life is wanting to be part of intergenerational movement building. Um, you know, just like last week, um, I had a South Asian dinner party that um, Saloni and I co-hosted, and someone brought a friend of theirs who was, you know, everyone at this party was probably like 20s, 30s, um, and someone brought um, a friend of theirs who was in her 50s, and she was a South Asian woman who, you know, told us a lot about the experience of, like, raising her biracial daughter here in New York City, and, like, I think also when I was at Sucky and was able to be part of doing organizing work alongside South Asian immigrant women in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, like, I had so much to learn, will continue to have so much to learn, and I think that part of getting through to the other side of that, similar to the solidarity conversation, um, is being okay with the mess. Um, it is gonna be messy. Like, you're gonna be right and you're gonna be wrong. And I think it's mostly going to take an incredible amount of patience and care. And I think also contextualizing, like, the many sacrifices that have been made so that you get to be here and exist in this room and have these conversations. And I think that that tension can exist alongside, um, you know, building a future together where everyone's needs are recognized. And I will say too, just on the question of the tension of having abolitionist um, practices and values while also living in a deeply carceral and capitalistic world, um, you know, I myself have a long, long way to go, I think, in actually being able to adopt that mindset. Um, it is very difficult to actually embody and think about transformational justice as a concrete solution to the problems that we face in this world, when I also think things all the time like, oh yeah, like, you should murder your rapist. You know, it's like, it is, 
it is very, very hard. And it is actually supposed to be messy and difficult. And the conversations are supposed to be hard. Um, they're meaningful because they're hard. And I think that there is room for everybody's experience at the table. And I don't think the point is so much like get everyone to agree or get everyone on the same page as you, but how, what, how might we rather exist in relationship to one another where we're actually able to like hear other people's experiences and also like invite ourselves to grow more and learn from the perspectives of people that we aren't fully aligned with but have so much to learn from, um, like our elders. Other questions? I think rightfully so a lot of the discussion has been focused on like what things we are doing and the actions within the community and so much of it is targeted to like finding the needs of the community, how do we support this, how do we engage people. What do you think would be a useful way to engage people outside? Is that something that is important because especially to people in power or people like higher up in the racial hierarchy, like those are often the people who I feel like cause more fear or violence on our communities. Is there, like I think you guys are all talking like about the stuff we do within our community because we need the attention there, but is there something that we should do either in terms of like education, outreach, or like something else to do facing outward to change like their, like the amount of violence they inflict on our communities? This is not a direct answer to that question, but something we were kind of talking about. But we'll note that there has been such an abundance of amazing writing that explores the Asian American experience with complexity and nuance and has kind of specific calls to action that I think are wonderful to share with kind of outside. I'm not always sure that, you know, um, like Joe Biden's reading Kathy Park Hong, but I think he maybe should, it would be useful. And so that I do think like writing and being honest and unflinching and how we represent what we mean and not overly simplifying it is something. Um, I'm kind of curious about your answer to that, Leon, if you have one, not to put you on the spot. No, go ahead. <laughs> So I once had this, I recently had a conversation with a, a very good friend of mine who are, we're working together and we talked about whether we believe in the so-called the American project, right? That elusive, elusive American project, the more unity, you know how we've all heard many presidents talk about it. And my friend said she believes in it. Right, and that's one of the reasons why she wakes up every morning and gets dressed up for Zoom and gets on that call and engages, right? And I think I was feeling low that day and I was saying, I don't know if I believe in it, right? And you know, and I also had this recent experience that I was sharing, I may be sharing way too much of, so bear with me. <laughs> um, so, you know, I have an Asian name, and kind of when I was engaging people out in the world, at least just like being in person, if somebody mispronounced my name, I could just correct it, and that person would sort of get the correction. What I realized in the Zoom world is like, it's really hard for people to correct my name. And it, I have to say, like, I'm, I've been around the block many times, and I was just like, it was like, I actually had a really hard time. And somehow in my mind, like this, like engaging others who are not Asians, engaging others who couldn't say my name, and so much of that was connected to like, do we believe in the American project? Do we believe in transformation? Do we believe in social change? Like I was like, so much of that got wrapped up with whether a, a white person who was getting on a Zoom with me could say my name correctly or not. And so I've been sitting with that for a while. And so it's, this is my long-winded way of saying, I wake up every morning to get on that 10 o'clock Zoom, and I, I am talking about why the dignity and respect for 
low-wage workers, domestic workers, and why this country must invest in working-class communities and no one should be left behind as we are coming out of this pandemic is because I also believe in that American project and because I also believe that I have to reach across the aisle, I have to engage, I have to educate, and I have to make my case that we can be better, right, tomorrow than we were today. So I think about it that way. It's not like, do I get frustrated? Absolutely, you know? Do I get annoyed that somebody, that I felt invisible on a call or I walk into a room and felt invisible? Absolutely. But, you know, I think it's like trying one more time. And I, th like, I go back to what I said. I think, like, I look back to the work I've done since I left NYU to do other things. Like, we made tremendous progress as a broader movement, right? As a social justice movement, as a sector, right? I mean, I think for me and for my organization, for President Biden to say, I'm going to invest in caregiving, it's huge. So I think about it that way. No, oh, I'm just really in awe of your casual dinner conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I also wonder if there's something to be said about naming when we do feel a smart that we're not supposed to, you know, there's things that can feel um, like you're supposed to go along and get along. And I feel like we've kind of reached a point where I am increasingly unwilling to do it. Um, I recently had a job interview where I had to give a talk and um, the person introducing me refused to call me anything other than Celine. And this is something we, this person had met me for hours. We had had hours of interviews. Um, he had read my entire dissertation. You know, there's a lot there. And there was kind of a casual disrespect about it that I think was intended to make me feel small. And I don't know if that was some sort of, you know, arch scheme, but I talked about it a lot after it happened to every white person I saw because I kind of wanted to name that that happened and it was bad. And I think that it, the more we can do that in small ways, the more it can become, um, if not unacceptable, at least clear what you're doing when you mispronounce someone's name habitually or don't bother to learn it or, you know, whatever it is. Um, I am anti getting along. My <laughs> philosophy is more get out of my way. So, which I also think is a useful one. I think we may be coming to our time, but any other questions? Go ahead. Hi, um, first of all, thank you so much. I think all three of you are so amazing. Uh, my question is, so like as law students and as future lawyers or legal professionals, we really operate in like these positions of privilege and you know we just have so much privilege and a lot of the public interest advocacy work that you know public interest students here want to do is about centering and focusing on the goals of the most marginalized communities and i think i'm just kind of nervous that you know i'll like lose sight of that or like be blind to something that i shouldn't be blind to because of my because of the position of privilege that i occupy so i was wondering if you guys have any tips on how to battle that or combat that Great question. <laughs> um, I think this is something, this is a tension and a conflict that I think is really present in all kinds of professional worlds. Um, you know, I've worked in the nonprofit world basically my entire life, which definitely is a structure that reifies a lot of the oppression that we um, supposedly are set out to undo. I know that Saloni experiences this as well as an academic. Um, I think, again, this, some of the solutions to that come back to this question of, like, of solidarity and practice. Who am I spending time with and who am I learning from? If I look around at the group of people that I text every day, that I hang out with the most on the weekends, um, that I spend my face time with, like, are they all people who largely share my experience? And if so, I actually have a great responsibility to disrupt that. Um, and I think also there's, once again, like comes back to that question of 
how am I utilizing the space that I have in um, a room where people are going to be looking to me, where I'm going to be in a position to be heard and listened to? Um, who, who else's ex experiences am I bringing into that room? That's also all of our responsibility. And I think that, honestly, it's not a great answer, but I think like that's a tension we all have to live with forever. <laughs> we have to be okay with it. Um, it's not gonna go away, and it's always gonna be imperfect. But a conversation that we had at lunch today was sort of about reframing wins from these large scale structural mass changes. Um, you know, obviously, if I could, I would want to have health care for all tomorrow. Is that going to happen? Definitely not. Um, but how can I reframe how I think about wins and progress in terms of like really small scale things that can help change like one person's life or day? And how can I ensure that that's as important and impactful to me as some of these large scale structural changes that we're all working towards? You know, another function of white supremacy is to only see wins as things that are highly visible um, and impactful on a grand scheme. And so I would encourage all of us to reframe how we think about progress to ensure that all of those small wins and all those small moments of like, success and victory feel as important to us as these large-scale structural changes that we're working towards every day. And I also think time, time spent with the communities that you are working with, dealing with, elevating, you know, I, as a historian, it's somewhat easier to make sure that I'm including marginalized voices because I work with static documents that I either choose the archives I'm looking at, am I including oral history, am I thinking about people who are not in government documents. I think that's somewhat easier than when you're doing kind of dynamic work and dealing with real people who might disagree with each other even though they are equally marginalized or both very marginalized, right? People are uh, multifaceted and I think Sometimes there is an expectation in the kind of nonprofit grind or capitalistic grind that you have a 45 minute standing meeting and that's somehow enough to understand something, but what you're actually absorbing is a press release that someone has prepared for you. I think really making sure that we can slow down and spend time with people, understand their lives, their days, um, what is important to them, behooves us all in actually building community. We talked a lot about kind of the importance of friendship and organizing and being with people that you trust and doing political work with people that you trust. Um, and I think the same is kind of my instinct to say the same is true for not losing sight of um, what the meat of what you're working for is, is to you know, really spend time with in the spaces that you're seeking to improve. Is that the last round? Thank you, everyone. Thank you. This has been an incredible discussion. Um, I just want to um, segue to one piece of housekeeping, which is that we are having a reception with food and beer and wine at Bear Burger on LaGuardia Place between West Third and Bleecker. Come, invite your friends. There's lots of food and drink. Um, so, but back to our amazing discussion. Um, I'm, I'm blown away and speechless um, at the sort of all that you wove together, um, the layering and complexity that you held. Um, and, and honestly, um, I, I come away with more questions and more curiosity, um, which I think is the mark of a successful discussion. So um, I am incredibly grateful to all of you for being here, um, to our audience for engaging so much, and um, I want to give you another round of applause. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you all so much.